I don't know how I feel about this hairstyle anymore. I'm kind of over it. Guys, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to start. Should I start with glasses? Should I do no glasses? I don't know. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. If you are new here, my name is Sharika. I am 18 years old, a first year in university, and a student athlete. In today's video, I'm going to be talking or discussing Black Canadian athletes. Now, wait. This is not necessarily a history lesson, so don't be thinking I'm just going to be talking about history. But I'm going to be talking about these athletes while I paint. So I have two beautiful canvases here. I don't know what I'm going to use. I think I'm going to use a smaller one. And we're just going to be painting because I always, I like painting. I really do. The last time I painted, I did like this sunset. Was that the last thing? No, that was not the last thing. That's a lie. Um, I think the last thing I did was, it was a Mickey Mouse. <laughs> but today I'm going to be, I think I'm going to try to paint a silhouette of like a black woman's body or something. I'm sure y'all have seen those. I'm sure you've seen them like on Pinterest, on Instagram, everywhere, literally. But that's what I'm gonna be doing today. I didn't want it to be like a history lesson and stuff. I wanted it to be more just chilling, vibing, doing some painting, and talking a little bit about history, I guess. So if you guys wanna learn a little bit more about black Canadian athletes in history, keep on watching, okay? If you're a sports lover, if you're an athlete, if you're just curious about some black Canadian athletes that you probably never heard of, probably have, because I'm not going to be highlighting the ones that you probably know, just because I'm just not. I'm not going to lie, some of these that I, I talked about or I'm going to be talking about, I didn't know at all. I'm not only that, but as a Canadian, we talk a lot about American athletes. We really do. So that's what we're going to be doing today. So feel free to sit back, relax, whatever calms you, whether that's taking a bath, the drinking a little sum sum cooking eating whatever it is chill out with me if you want to paint as well get your all your supplies your paint brushes and whatnot and we finna get into it i'm gonna be talking about four four black canadian athletes if you see me looking over here it's because i'm trying to look at my notes that i created about these athletes and if my head looks lopsided it's because this side never wants to go flat but make sure you have all your painting supplies if you're gonna paint as well with me Let's get going, sweetheart. Okay, y'all, so the first athlete that we're going to be talking about is Angela James. So she was born December 22nd, 1964 in Toronto, Ontario. And she is the daughter of a white Canadian from Toronto by the name of Donna Barreto. Bar I don't know if I'm saying her name right. I don't know. I'm sorry if I'm saying it wrong. But... I think it's Barreto, Barato. I'm so sorry, oh my gosh. And then her father, who is a black American, who goes by the name of Leo James. And he is from Mississippi. He actually went to Canada to escape from all the racial segregation that was going on in America at the time. And so she's not the only child. She has two half brothers and then two half sisters on her mother's side. But her father, let me tell you something, her father was very much involved in a nightclub in Toronto and he got around. Oh my gosh, like I can't even, he got around. He really did because, because, she has at least nine other siblings, nine other half siblings from her father because her father couldn't, he couldn't keep it in his pants. But yes, so she has nine other siblings from her father's side. So pretty much her par parents worked together and so she grew up in a single parent home in relative poverty in the neighborhood of Flemington Park. During her childhood, her mother had made many sacrifices to even give James the opportunities to play hockey. And so she was raised with a white mother and so being a mixed race child, she was treated very differently. Her siblings, her two half sisters who she actually lived with, were white so her own grandparents actually treated her very differently which is so unfortunate but during that time racial segregation and discrimination was very common and she faced many insults and racial discrimination because she was mixed-raced 
And like to know if like her own grandparents treated her differently. Mm -mm. So eventually, being in love with hockey, she used to play road hockey with the boys in her neighborhood. And due to the lack of girl hockey teams back in her neighborhood, or I feel like just in general, um, she just continued to play road hockey with the boys in her neighborhood, as well as she joined a boys hockey league in Flemington Park. And so right off the bat, she was the top scorer like in the overall league. These guys had nothing on her. They had nothing on her. So she was a top scorer, but following her second year, I, like I'm actually so upset by this, but the parents of the other boys in the league and the league officials, they couldn't help themselves. They were just too jealous to see a girl winning, a girl doing better than the boys. And so there was a new policy that was passed that pretty much restricted the membership to boys only. They just didn't want to see a girl win. What's that about? Like, they always want to see the girl who's down and like down bad. Like, oh my gosh. So she eventually had to move on from that and find a girls hockey program somewhere in her community, neighborhood, or just in her city and by the way the only reason why she was even able to join the league in the first place was because her mom actually threatened to take legal action against the league officials because they were already refusing to let her play simply because she was a girl so mind you they let her play but it was after the fact when her mom threatened to take legal action <laughs> come on now so eventually she found this hockey program in Don Mills. So then at the age of 13, she played senior women's hockey with Newton Brook Saints. Woo! So during her time in high school, she was very much exposed to many of the common things, alcohol, drugs, and she got herself into a lot of fights. That eventually led to her not paying attention to her academic studies. She was actually really doing really bad at the point where she was gonna drop out of school. And so she was encouraged eventually by her own vice principal that, hey, you need to pay attention to your studies, especially if you want to continue playing hockey in college. You need to fix up, figure it out, so you can graduate high school. She eventually graduated from Overly High School, which is now known as Mark Garniu. I think that's how you say the school. If that's not how you say it, I'm so sorry, but she graduated from Overly High School and it's now known as Mark Garniu Collegiate Institute, which, fun fact, my high school religion teacher is now the vice principal of that school. Just, just a little fun fact about me, okay? She eventually moved on to Seneca College and she struggled academically, not only because of her past that she had already, but the fact that she was working two part-time jobs to help her family financially, as well as she was playing on two hockey teams, not only in her college, but also at community level. So she was juggling all this and so her coach had told her that like, hey, like if you want to continue playing college level hockey, you got to fix up with your academics. You need to take your academics seriously because yes, you're on a scholarship, but that does not mean you can not pay attention to your academics because you're a student athlete. Student comes first, athlete comes second. During her time at Seneca, aside from hockey, she also played softball in 1983 and she led her team to the inaugural Wow, I can't say thanks. Um, OCAA Women's Softball Championship. And in 1984 and 85, she was also named the OCA's All-Star, in which she also finished silver medal with her team. Applaud for her because she's doing the damn thing. Not only that, but she led her team to many other college championships, and she was the top leading scorer in the league for three consecutive seasons. Not only that, but she played a defense in 1984 and 85, and she managed to score 50 goals. 50 goals. Come on now, let me tell you something. Angela James, you deserve your flowers, girl. You really do. So she was eventually named the Athlete of the Year by the OCAA for her talents and skills in both softball and hockey. And she set records of literally 80 goals, 128 points in the game of hockey. So yeah, she most definitely deserved the Athlete of the Year. And then eventually the program in like the overall college 
um, women's hockey. And unfortunately got disbanded the entire program because there was a lack of competing teams. And so Seneca retired James's jersey and she was inducted in the Seneca's Varsity Hall of Fame in 1985 and 2004. Although, the, although they pretty much ended the program, I mean, she did make a name for herself, especially in her first year, so that's pretty cool. Okay, so moving on to 1987, the Ontario Women's Hockey Association was hosting their very first world championship. And so Team Canada was being represented by the Hamilton Hawks. At the same time, Team Ontario was being represented by James's usual team that she played with in Mississauga. But even though she was eligible to play for both teams, she chose, of course, her usual team in Mississauga. Unfortunately, even though her team got down to the finals with Team Canada, Team Canada defeated them and won the title. Eventually in 1990, the I double the I the double IHF the double IHF had their very first official women's championship and it was taking place in Ottawa in the year of 1990. James was representing Team Canada and she scored the first goal in the tournament's history. So that's pretty amazing. As well as she tied American Sydney Curley for the lead scorer in the tournament. Coming down to the final game, Team Canada and the US were the last team standing. And Canada took the title and won from five to two. So that's pretty amazing. Look at us Canadians <laughs> winning things. <laughs> No, but that's pretty cool, especially because like I don't really, I don't really watch hockey necessarily. I've watched hockey games before. Like I've I've gone to hockey games back in Toronto. It's a pretty cool sport. It is. I personally just don't watch it often. It's not that I don't like it. I just don't watch it often. But doing this research about James, it's pretty cool. It's pretty interesting stuff. So James then appeared in three more World Championships and she took the gold medal in all three years, 1992, 1994, and in 1997, she took the gold by overtime. Around this time, unfortunately, James was suffering with some health issues and she was pretty much undiagnosed with Graves disease. And this is pretty much a thyroid condition which results to weight loss and fatigue. And so nearing into the new games that were coming in, the national team was under a new coach and yes, James was a part of the roster but she wasn't necessarily put in like the best role simply because all that lost time from trying to regain her strength and her you know athletic ability from the Graves disease. Even though, even though she had all that lost time, she was selected as one of the first shooters and she scored the winning goal which led Canada to a 3-2 victory and pretty much she ended off her career with 50 games for Canada scored 33 goals and 21 assists so that's pretty amazing although her playing career was over she still was heavily involved in the sport of hockey and she had been a certified ref since 1980 but she then got her further certifications and became the referee in chief for the Ontario Women's Hockey Association. She went on to coach Seneca's college team and helped them win the Ontario College Championship in 1987. And under her coaching, Team Ontario also won the Under 18 Championship in 2001. Before becoming a senior sports coordinator at Seneca, she established a school called the Breakaway Adult Hockey School, and she also became the director of Seneca College's Women women's hockey school. Woo, that was a tongue twister, was that? Ah. So eventually in 2008, she was one of the first three women inducted into the International Ice Hockey Federation of Hall of Fame. So she got her flowers, y'all. She really did, she got her flowers. Also, there's a whole award named after her called the Angela James Bowl. And this is pretty much awarded to the highest scoring player in Canada's women's hockey league. So. Again, she got her flowers, y'all. 
She also was inducted in Canada's Sports Hall of Fame in Toronto as she was one of the first women to be inducted. Making history over here. She also was awarded by the YCCA Woman of Distinction Award for sport. And this was pretty much recognizing and highlighting her role um, that she played in the development of free hockey programs for girls at her old ice rink. And so in 2009, Toronto actually renamed the ice rink the Angela James Arena. So that is it for Angela James and pretty much her career. She is still living um, and is still doing amazing things in the sport of hockey. Not necessarily playing, but still is heavily involved in the sport. So that is it for our lovely hockey player, Angela James. If you guys would like to know a little bit more about her, you can always search her up and do a little more research if you would like. If you're a hockey lover, now you know another hockey player. Maybe you already knew her. So, yeah. So our next athlete that we're going to be talking about, you probably have heard of her. I don't know. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. I don't know. I've heard of her before. I just didn't know too much about her except for like her event that she did and that she was Canadian and other things like the Olympics and stuff. But anyways, we're going to get into it. So our next athlete is Peridita Felician. Felician. Sorry, her last name. Ugh, I hate butchering people's names. I really do. But her name is Perdita Felician, and so she was born in August 29th, 1980 in Oshawa, Ontario. She then moved to Pickering, Ontario, and this is where she began competing in track and field events at her school. So she first competed in the 100 meter dash, and she was always inspired and looked up to the greats such as Donovan Bailey, um, Bruni Sarin, and so she then competed in the 200 meter and also long jump. So eventually after kind of figuring out and trying to discover which event she liked the most, she eventually dedicated all of her skills to hurdling and that became her main event. During her time attending Pine Ridge Secondary School, she won the Ontario High School Hurdling Championship title. And she eventually added two more of those Canadian Junior Championship titles. So she was really doing amazing for herself and you kind of see later on when she goes to college. But later on, her performance at a specific meet, which was a scholastic meet back in Ohio, garnered her numerous athletic scholarships from universities in the US. And out of those, she chose University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Why was that gonna be so hard to say just now? But she chose the University of Illinois and she continued her academic journey in studying kinesiology. So during her first year of ever competing in the university level competition, Paradita earned All-American honors as well as she set the record for the fastest freshman in NCAA history in the 100 meter hurdles. So she already started right off the bat, like successful. <laughs> The next year, she was ranked number one by the NCAA for the entire outdoor season. Like, I'm, I'm like, it's not like I didn't, like I did the research before, but it's like, whoa, like, wow. She really did that, you know? She also was her, her school's first ever athlete to win a national championship. And this is during both the indoor and outdoor season. So she was the first ever to do it to ever do it so that's wow and this was during her second year wow <laughs> wow so for her amazing performance her school awarded her with the first of three three consecutive university of illinois female athlete of the year and she also was voted the u.s's track coaches association national female outdoor athlete of the year that sounded like a lot but it is actually a lot to say so after all of that she continued to win more national titles and she was also named her school's big 10 conference athlete of the year she continued to earn many more NCAA honors and awards and even from all that she became a major force in the world of 100 meter hurdles. She pretty much ended off that season with taking the gold medal in the 100 meter hurdle finals at the 2003 World Championships in Paris. Eventually this win actually made Paradita Canada's first ever female to win gold in an individual event at the World Championships. So. Wow. So I know I'm like, I'm just thinking about it, you know? It's like sinking in, you know? And I knew about her, but 
obviously you learn things along the way and <laughs> I'm impressed. Very impressed by that. Not only that, but she also was the first female in Illinois track and field history to win gold in an individual event at the World Championships. So, representing her school, gotta represent. She then was also named Canada's Female Athlete of the Year, and it had been 25 years since any athlete was given the honor. 25. Almost 30 years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's remarkable, really. It's pretty cool. So in the month of March of the year 2004, she was competing against a three-time hurdles world championship in the 60-meter hurdle final at the 2004 IAAF World Indoor Championships. And so she set a new record defeating the great Gail Devers. And so after that, she won six straight wins. And with the Summer Olympics right around the corner, Many people were actually expecting her to pretty much take the gold in the 100 meter hurdles, especially because Devers had pulled out of the race due to an injury. But unfortunately, Pierdita failed to get over the first hurdle, and so she ended up falling into someone else's lane, knocking over that athlete. Now that didn't stop her, she returned back to the track and ended up winning many more medals and world championships as well. In 2007, she ran a good race that awarded her with a silver medal at the World Championships in the 100 meter hurdles. So later on in the year of 2008 for the Summer Olympics in Beijing, Perdita was unable to compete due to a foot injury. So she ended up being a guest commentator for the ABC televised segment for the Olympic coverage of hurdles. In the summer of 2011, she relocated to the University of Calgary in order to train under former national team head coach Les Gramantic and her old coach Gary Winkler. So throughout training, she was also alongside ranked number six heptathlete in the world, Jessica Zlenka. So a year later, in June 2012, unfortunately, Perdita failed to qualify for the Canadian Olympic team. She came third, but this was under protest, and it's also because she false started and ended up just being disqualified. So that was obviously an unfortunate situation. Like with these things, once you fall start, that's it. Like there is no flag, like, there's nothing. You're just, you're just disqualified. So yeah, she did finish third. She did fall start, but she also finished third after. And she was able to run, but it was under protest. And um, they pretty much denied her protest and she was just disqualified overall. So a new year comes along, 2013 has arrived, and Peridita decides that she's gonna retire from competing. She eventually made the decision to go back to school and she studied journalism. So, I'm like, that's what like I'm lucky doing. It's nice to like know that she's like doing similar things that I'm doing. So then she became a writer slash reporter for the CHCH News in Hamilton, Ontario. And then she also became a member of the broadcasting team for the 2015 Pan Am Games that took place in Toronto, Ontario. She eventually joined the CBC TV network. And that is when in 2018, she broadcasted the Winter Olympics in South Korea. And then the Tokyo Olympics in 2021. So. Good for her because at least she's still involved in overall like track and field in some way. So that is it about Perdita Felician. I, I already knew about her, like I knew a good amount of things, but obviously doing this research, there are so many things that I did learn. But she did have a really decent career, even though I do think, I think it ended pretty early for her, but she had a decent career and a decent amount of success. And she made a name for herself in, you know, Canadian history, so that's pretty amazing. Guys, is my you guys can't even see it. But I'm doing the silhouette. I think it's like almost done. I think I can start painting now. I got all my paints, I have my brown paints. This is the paint I use, y'all. Oh my gosh. This is the paint I'm gonna use for the actual body because she's gonna be black. I don't know if this brown is too Cinnamon brown. Just so you know, I'm not a professional. I don't know if <gasps> I don't have white. Oh shoot. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. How do you make white? That's not a thing. I wish. George Dixon is the next athlete we're gonna be talking about. He is, or was, I should say, sorry, a Canadian boxer. And we're gonna get into it. 
So George Dixon was born July 28th, 1870 in Africville, Nova Scotia. And this specific community that he grew up in was predominantly black. But eventually he moved with his family to Boston as a child. As he got older, he took an interest in photography and became or served as an apprentice to a local photographer. And so many of the people that they would photograph were boxers for promotional photos. And so that's pretty much how George was introduced to the sport of boxing. So because he was such a quick learner and literally a natural at the sport, he had his first match in 1886 at the age of 16 in the Bantam weight division. And so he won his first match. Mind you, he was only five foot three and 87 pounds. 87? You're five three in your own, no, that doesn't make sense. And so he won this by knockout. That's how he won this specific match. So during this time in 1880, Dixon had won the World Bantam Weight Championship title in Boston. And so everyone believed, as well as himself, had thought that he held the title of the world champion. But because during that time there was a lack of structure or a lack of organizational structure in the world of boxing, so there were actual other fighters who claimed this title. And so in 1888, Dixon and his manager traveled to England to settle the dispute. And on June 27th, Dixon defeated Nunk Wallace from England by knockout in 18, 18 rounds. After this fight, Dixon became the first black fighter to be crowned with the world champ in boxing history. Okay, so George Dixon had his first successful Bantam weight defense, defensive fight, I should say, um, on October 23rd in the year of 1890. And so this was in a 40 round match against Johnny Murphy on Providence, Rhode Island. This was the world's longest Bantam fight. Okay, now mind you, Dixon was used to these long matches because his stamina was, it was extraordinary. Like, it was incredible. He even had fought much longer matches. So like, he went, he's, fought 70 rounds before that lasted four hours and uh 37 minutes so and mind you that match specifically i'm talking about the 70 round one it all ended in a draw are we looking good we're looking good so after exploring that division dixon decided to go on to the featherweight division and he obviously had to gain a little more weight and he ended up weighing 115 pounds so he left his Bantam weight title um, after he had his March 31st, 1891 defeat against Cal McCarthy in Troy, New York after he pretty much took the title for the featherweight championship. So, wow, he just, he's really good. So he became the first person to hold world titles in two weight classes and he held the title for the featherweight champ for nine years. Nine years. Also, Dixon was given this nickname later on in his career called Little Chocolate. I don't know why I don't like that nickname. I'm not very fond of it. I'm just not. So according to the International Boxing Hall of Fame, Dixon had retired after a career record of 50 victories, 40 draws, 27 losses, and seven with no decision. Dixon did endure and experience a lot of racial discrimination and at the time he was also married to a white woman and during the post-civil war dixon faced like he faced racism on a regular basis especially during a tournament in the new orleans famed olympic club in 1892 there was a specific fighting match with jack skelly or skelly and he is a white champion and this fight made a turn for the worse after dixon had Baroque Skilly's nose and knocked him out in the eighth round and so there were many threats made towards him and also threats to riot and so because of these threats towards him and also um, just the overall having a mixed race match 
that whole entire concept was eventually banned and this continued to soar throughout America and eventually just lower the chances and opportunities for many other black fighters to compete or fight against um, non-black people. Okay y'all, I'm back. It might look darker just because I my battery was dying. But we've been to get into it. Sorry, that was I literally have to go charge it for a couple of minutes. So hopefully I'll have enough enough battery to get in the Okay, so we were talking about George Dixon and he was very known as a cerebral fighter and a natural athlete. And so in 1986, he published a book or a guide, I guess, called A Lesson on Boxing. This book highlighted his strategies in the game of boxing and his punching philosophy. And so in the book, you will kind of read a bit about his unique training styles and methods. So whether you do boxing professionally or you just do it to work out or like a method to work out, the term shadow boxing or the overall concept of shadow boxing was actually created or invented by George Dixon because he would always do shadow boxing for one of his training methods. I guess it wasn't as common as it was before he did it so that's that's pretty cool and like that's just something that we normally do like if you're just training or if you're just you know working out and doing boxing lessons and stuff like that's something that you normally do so that's pretty cool that he it's pretty much invented by him so despite the fact that he earned at least 250 dollars in his entire career the final chapter of his life didn't end the best he fell into the world of drinking and he also was living in poverty so he was pretty much homeless um in the city of new york and was drinking a lot he became an alcoholic and so that last chapter of his life it wasn't the best because he was homeless and pretty much drank his life away I'm not even trying to say it as like, like that's just that's just what it was. And so he died in the year of 1908 in the alcoholism ward in New York's Bellevue Hospital. And so there was actually a memorial fountain in his honor that was put in place in New York, but it was actually later on taken down um, or removed because street construction decided to take over. And yeah, so that was George Dixon's life. And so he was awarded many Hall of Fames. He has many honors in his name. And so although the last chapter of his life wasn't the greatest, he did have a pretty good life. Despite his death and the way he died, he did have a pretty good, decent career. Okay, y'all, if the lighting looks different, it's because sunset came upon us quite early. He also was ranked number one Bantam weight fighter of all time, according to The Ring magazine. Dixon also was ranked number six in the Nova Scotia Sport Hall of Fame's list of the top 15 Nova Scotian athletes of all time. And also, he has a community center named after him in Halifax. He's a part of Canadian history, so. And he's definitely one that I, I had no idea about him at all, just because I also don't, I don't really watch boxing and I don't really know too much about boxing other than just how the game is played. Our last and our final athlete that we're going to be discussing and talking a little bit about is Larry Gaines. Now Larry Gaines is another fellow black Canadian boxer and we're going to get into it. So Gaines was born on December 12th, 1900. Sorry, I don't know if I'm going to say this right, but Sumaj Street in Cabbage Town neighborhood of Toronto. So Gaines actually started boxing at the age of 20, which is pretty amazing because it just goes to show that it's never too late to chase your dreams. It's never too late to start something. Age 20, usually like boxers will start at like 16, just like how Dixon did. So that's pretty cool to know that he started a little older. As I said, it goes to show like, you can start at any age. If you want to start a sport, if you want to start a new, whatever it is, whatever it is, it's never too late. So Gaines had a pretty successful amateur career. And then he decided to take his career to the professional level. He traveled to London, making his first professional debut as the Toronto Terror. 
in June 1923. A lot of his fights had happened in London. So he also had many fights in Germany and that is also where he defeated Max Schmeling in 1925. Later on in 1927, he became Canadian heavyweight champion when he stopped Horace Soldier Jones in five rounds in Toronto. He eventually settled down in England in 1930 where many of his fights were being held and he was also known as a slick boxer, especially after he knocked out Phil Scott in front of 30,000 people and with that win he took the British Empire title also with that being said this was around the time when the color bar was still put in place but eventually in 1932 this color bar was lifted and eventually he fought white South African Donald McCarkindale. Also, another thing to say is during this fight, his trainer actually collapsed and passed away. Um, and this was during the fight, so I really couldn't imagine like what he went through after, like after the fact it happened, like he went back to go fight and stuff like. Mm -mm. After that specific fight, Gaines became the second black fighter to fight at the Royal Albert Hall. So. Gaines later on went to defeat Primo Canera in front of 70,000 people, despite the fact that Canera had an advantage of 60 pounds in weight and then four inches in height. I mean, David did it to Goliath, so like, anything's possible, you know? <laughs> So although Gaines was one of the top heavyweights in his era, he was also denied the chance to compete for many other world titles because there were rules and policies that were set in place for black boxers. And that eventually meant that he had to go on to compete in colored heavyweight championships, which is no problem, that's fine. Um, it's just it sucks that they didn't have the opportunity to be able to go on and win world titles. But, although that happened, he competed in the Colored Heavyweight Championship and won in 1928 and 1935. So, <laughs> it didn't matter where he went, he still won, you know? So later on in life, he eventually joined the British Army as a physical trainer instructor and he served as a sergeant major in the Pioneer Corps in the Middle East. He retired at the age of 40. His last fight was a defeat to Jack London in June 1942. And this fight was actually raising funds for the RAF Benevolent Fund. After he retired, he was working low paying jobs, as well as he was jailed for three months because he stole money from his job. And he did plead guilty and he said he would repay them. After all, of that went down he became a singer slash drummer for a hotel band and in the early 1960s Gaines lived on Tooting Broadway and worked as a salvage collection merchant so after that he went into car sales and became a boxing instructor or boxing trainer and he was also happily married to his wife Lisa and had four children by the name of Betty Harold Anne, and John so there is an autobiography about Gaines and it's called The Impossible Dream. This was published back in 1976. And the title is a reference to his dream of becoming a world champion. And Max Schmeling, or Schmeling, um, contributed a forward, which is pretty cool, like someone that Gaines defeated. You know, at the end of the day, it's all love. <laughs> Gaines is no longer alive. He actually died. Um, in July 1983 from a heart attack while he was visiting his relatives in Cologne, Germany. So in terms of legacies and honors, in 2020, award-winning author Mark Allen published the first comprehensive account um, of the World Colored Heavyweight Championship. And this is from 1876 to 1937. In 2015, Gaines was finally, I don't know why he wasn't before, but he was finally inducted into Canada's Sports Hall of Fame. Larry Gaines had a pretty good career. Kind of, I guess you can say he in some ways had a similar um, experience, um, just like George Dixon, because they were both black boxers and very successful in their era. But they both were incredible boxers in their time or during their time. And 
they got the flowers too <laughs> i think it's so important to do your research on certain things like this especially things that you're interested in because honestly like all the athletes that i know i didn't necessarily learn them from school because i grew up being an athlete like i always played sports my entire life I just kind of learned them myself based off of watching the Olympics when I was younger all the time. So it's pretty interesting to see some of the athletes in Canadian history that I personally didn't know before. Y'all thought I was gonna be finished. <laughs> I am not finished yet. <laughs> I'm still like thinking about, about Angela James's father. I hope you guys still learned something and enjoyed this video because I definitely did. Okay, y'all. <laughs> it's so late. Oh my gosh. Literally, I just took time to finish the painting because I obviously wanted to show you guys when I was finished. But this is the end of the video. And this is my lovely painting. It's whatever. I mean, I want it to be like cut off. I don't even want it to be like a full neck. I might make it a full neck. It depends. But this is how it looks. I'll probably show like a little more of it. Um, but that is it for today's video. I hope that you guys all enjoyed it. I hope you learned something, learned some new athletes maybe you didn't know of or you probably knew of, but now I just gave you a little more knowledge, a little more things that you didn't know about them. Now you know. I hope you guys did enjoy this video. Please give it a thumbs up if you did. If you didn't like it, don't give it a thumbs down. Just go in the comments down below and let me know what you think I should do to make my videos better. If you guys want me to do another video like this where like I'm painting and like answering questions or just talking about something, let me know. I would love to do it because painting is really fun. It is. It's kind of nice. <laughs> Don't forget to let your mom, your dad, your sister, your brother, your aunt, your uncle, your grandma, your grandpa, your friends, and everyone else to support and to subscribe to a small YouTuber like me. I really would appreciate it. Um, thank you for supporting me in any way that you can and I hope that you have a lovely day, evening, night, whenever you're choosing to watch this. I love you guys. Till next time, my loves. Peace out.